So today, I'm going to talk to you guys and take you on a journey to the most extraordinary place that you never even knew existed. See, our world, we say, is three-dimensional. And what that means is there are three possible directions to move in. Right, if I want to find a point in this room, what I can tell you is how far forward or backward to move, and then left and right, so that's two, and then how far up or down. Right, if I want to find those lights, I walk forward a couple steps, over to the right, and up a certain amount, so that's three dimensions. And it's easy for us to imagine a world with fewer than three dimensions, like a flat two-dimensional world. That would be a place where there are only two possible ways to move. You could either go forward or backward, or left and right. But what if I told you that it's possible to have more than three dimensions, much more? Four, five, six, ten, a thousand? Well, there's a really wonderful book called Flatland. It was written in 1884 by a guy named Edwin Abbott. And it is a fictionalized memoir of a two-dimensional being named A Square. And he discovers higher dimensions for himself, and he comes back to his world to talk about it. But he does it a bit more aggressively than a TED Talk and gets in all sorts of trouble and gets thrown in jail. So in the depths of his despair while he's in prison, he writes this quote, which is my favorite quote from the book. It says that, Yet I exist in the hope that these memoirs in some manner I know not how, may find their way to the minds of humanity in some dimension, and may stir up a race of rebels who shall refuse to be confined to limited dimensionality. Ladies and gentlemen, I am one of those rebels. So in my rebellion, I created this program called Polytopia, which takes these abstract objects from higher dimensions and brings it into our world the best that we can. And some pretty strange things happen in higher dimensions. It's, it is a world so unbelievably strange, but yet filled with the most, most breathtaking beauty. So just to give you an idea of how strange it can be, I have one of my models here. This is called a Klein bottle. I know some of you in the back might not be able to see it, so there's a picture of it behind me. Okay, now, there are kind of lines crisscrossing uh, around this object. And if you stand at a point that's kind of the intersection of two of them, like behind me where the red and the, the blue and the green lines intersect, if you stand at that point there, you could travel along the blue line or along the green line. Now something very strange happens in four dimensions. If you were to go along the blue line and just keep walking, like, on, like for example, on, on a sphere, like our Earth, if I were to walk straight right now, assuming there's nothing in my way, Eventually, I would come back right around to where I'm standing right now in the same position. And if you were to walk around the blue line and just stay straight on that path on the surface of this climb bottle, the same thing would happen. You would come back to that spot standing up just like as you were. However, if you turned to your right and followed the green path, you would go around, come back all the way around, except you would be standing upside down. And the funny thing is that you would not have known that anything strange is going on. Now, in this model, you can see it kind of crosses itself and intersects and whatnot. So if you were to walk on this, you would kind of bump into walls and you would say, hey, something fishing is going on here. However, in four dimensions, you could remove that. Just like if, if you were to take two lines in two dimensions that were crossing over each other, you can uncross them by lifting them up into three dimensions. So if you had like a figure eight, if you took a string and made a figure eight out of it that was crossed in the middle, you just lift it up into the third dimension and they are no longer crossing. Well, if you have two planes, two surfaces that are intersecting in three dimensions, you can lift one of them up into the fourth dimension and they will no longer be crossing. So this shape as it exists in the fourth dimension does not cross anywhere. You would walk along its surface and you would not suspect that anything is fishy go is going on. However, if you were to walk around it, indeed, something strange happens. Okay, now, what I'm gonna do next is explain a little bit about what higher dimensions mean. 
because I, you know, I've been talking about like, oh, this is a four-dimensional object, but what, is exact, what exactly does it mean to be a four-dimensional object? So I'm gonna do something a little loopy here. What I have are 3D printed models. All of these were made with a 3D printer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain how 3D printing works and then use that idea as an analogy to explain what higher dimensions are. Okay, oh, also, this picture here, this is what you usually see uh, a Klein bottle depicted as, so if anybody's ever heard of or seen a Klein bottle before, this is what you usually see. That thing I just showed you is actually kind of like, uh, if you were to perform liposuction on this, just kind of just suck it all in and it kind of tightens up, that's what you get. It's a little easier to see here the different paths. If you were to move around like the, the sort of bell, you would just go around, but if you were to follow it lengthwise, you would come back around. So anyway, all right, the way 3D printing works is you take your object and you cut it up into slices from the bottom up, right, just one layer at a time. And what you end up with is sort of like a, a blueprint, like you have here, of each layer of your three-dimensional object. So this would be like for a sphere, the one behind me. You have a sphere is basically a bunch of circles kind of stacked up on top of each other. And then the 3D printer just goes back and forth. There's actually one in the lobby right now, if any of you saw that on the way in. And you see it goes back and forth. It puts down one layer of material at a time and then builds it up slowly. So when you put it all together, you get something like this. And you can see in yellow, that's like one layer. So the, so the 3D printer would put down that yellow layer and then go on to the next one and then you get a, a sphere. Now the important thing I want you to remember from this is you are constructing a three-dimensional object by taking two-dimensional layers and putting them on top of each other. Okay, so 3D comes from 2D layers. A more familiar example of this is uh, an MRI. Right, so we take a 3D person, right, and each, this is like a little movie. So a movie's made of frames. Each of these frames is two-dimensional. It's, like it's like a picture, right? And if you were to stack these on top of each other, you would get a 3D person. So if you wanted to 3D print a person, you would take each of these layers and then stack them up. Okay, so again, just this principle of taking a 3D object and breaking it down into 2D slices and building them up. Okay, this is what we're gonna do to get to the fourth dimension. We're gonna take this idea and take it one step further. So, okay, but first, that direction that you stack the layers in is important because you don't just take the frames of a movie and put them next to each other. If you laid out the frames of a movie on a table, you don't just put the frames next to each other to make the 3D object. Then then it's just a movie strip. In order to actually make the 3D object, you need to take the frames and lift them up into this new direction. That's the third direction. So you have two dimensions, you add a third one, and you were to stack them in that third direction. So imagine a world where there was a fourth direction to move in, and you had three-dimensional layers and you want to stack those three-dimensional layers in this fourth direction. Now, I can't point to it. I, I can't tell you where it is because our world is not four-dimensional. But a four-dimensional world would be one where there is simply a fourth direction to move in, and you would stack your three-dimensional layers in this direction. So what I have behind me is, a, is an illustration of this example, and this is uh, the construction of a four-dimensional cube. So what we do is we kind of make a general definition for a cube. What we do is we take a cube from the previous dimension, take two copies of it, and then connect them together. So you start in zero dimensions. Zero dimensions means there's no possible directions to move in. There are, there are none, so you just have a single point. There's one point, you're, you are where you are, and you can't move anywhere. So a zero dimensional cube, the whole zero dimension is just a point. To make a one-dimensional cube, you take two copies of the point and connect them. So you have a line segment. To make a two-dimensional cube, which we call a square, you take two of those line segments. One of them is in red, the other one is in green, and then the blue lines are what are connecting them. So then you get a square. So two one-dimensional cubes, just a line segment, come together to make a square. And then you take two copies of a square, one in red, one in green, and then connect them with the blue lines, and then now what we have is a three-dimensional cube. Okay, so now we take two three-dimensional cubes, 
and then we take another copy of it and move it out in this fourth direction that we would have. And then you connect those together and you get a four-dimensional cube, which is also known as a tesseract. This guy right here is a, uh, is a tesseract that we've kind of chopped the corners off and blown out a little bit. And it's called an omni-truncated tesseract. It's just a fancy math term, but it just means like a chopped up tesseract. And then brought it back down to three dimensions. Okay, we could repeat this process into the fifth dimension. I take two copies of a four-dimensional cube, two tesseracts, connect those, and you get a five-dimensional cube. I keep going and going and going all the way to the tenth dimension. And then you get this. This is a 10-dimensional cube, okay? Now, it looks extremely complex, but let's think back to what I just said and maybe figure out why it is so complex. So if you're taking two copies of something, you are doubling the amount of points there are. Like a square has four corners. There are four, we call them vertices, a vertex. So there are four vertices. And when you make a three-dimensional cube, you double that. You have two copies of a square, so you have eight vertices. The tesseract, will have 16 vertices. Again, you're doubling. So you keep doubling and doubling and doubling, and by the time you get to the 10th dimension, you have 1,024 vertices. So a 10-dimensional cube has 1,024 corners. It's a lot going on, and then those are all connected up. So all these lines you, s you see behind me are all the connections between the corners of this 10-dimensional cube. So this is just a close-up of the center of the cube. Again, you can just see the complexity a little more clearly. You see immense symmetry. There's symmetry everywhere in this. All this structure just is very, very, very rich and very beautiful. And then you could keep going to the 24th dimension. <laughs> okay, now this. These are not even the, the, the edges of a 24-dimensional cube. A 24-dimensional cube has over 4 million corners, 4 million vertices. So all you're seeing are actually just single points generated from the vertices of a 24-dimensional cube. Every white pixel you're seeing there is a single vertex of the 24-dimensional cube. And in fact, this is just the middle of it. This is just zoomed in on the center. <laughs> this isn't even the whole thing. You're just looking at a close-up of the center of just the vertices of the 24-dimensional cube. So it's, you know, it's pretty complex. And yeah, that's an understatement. Okay, so. Uh, this, is a, this is just another view. I kind of shifted over. Um, you see the corner is now in the, the center is now in the corner of the screen. Um, so this is just kind of moving on over to the side. And you could start to see these like emergent patterns. There are these little clusters where the points come together and these little orbs around them. And you could find patterns in this. It's kind of like a, a mathematical Rorschach test or like looking at clouds. You know, it's like, oh, there's a bunny and you know, there's a guy drinking beer or whatever. So you could kind of play around with this and try and find little you know, pictures in it. Uh, this, and then here is uh, another view. Again, this is kind of moving towards the top of the cube. And again, you could just see these, these emergent structures coming out of the stru from the, just the, ver the vertices. Not even, it's not even connected yet. Okay, so now bringing it back down to, to four dimensions, you know, going all the way to 24, maybe getting a little vertigo, so we're gonna come back down to just four dimensions. Uh, what I have here, this is a 3D printed, uh, it's called the 120 cell, just a technical name, but it's sort of like a uh, four dimensional pentagon. I have one right here, oh, and this one is also in color, but the one that you're looking at is the one in my hand right here. And it's made up of all pentagons. If you look in the, in the picture, you see that all the, all the faces are actually pentagons. So you build up these pentagons uh, into this ball in four dimensions, and you get this here. And it has all these really nice uh, symmetry points. You look at it a certain way, and you, the, the lines and everything line up, and you get this really nice pattern. But there are multiple symmetry points, so this is one of them, and if you rotate it around, you get this here. So the one before, this had uh, tenfold symmetry, if you count it, or, uh, yeah, ten. And then you rotate around, now you have uh, sixfold symmetry. And you can rotate from one into the next. So you rotate this three-dimensional model around, and you go from this tenfold symmetry, it's a sixfold symmetry, and then there's another symmetry point, which is fourfold symmetry, and you can rotate from one into the other. And it's really cool. It will just transform before your eyes. All right, but now, 
what you're looking at, oh, you could also shine like a light on these. I wanted to try and do a demo of this, but it didn't work out so well. But if you were to shine a light at the right angle, you would see that image as a shadow on the ground or wherever you're projecting it. Uh, so you take a three-dimensional object and you get these 2D shadows. So you would have, for example, three different shadows. So your shadow would look like, like this, or like this one here, or the, you know, the four fields image. So you have different shadows, but they're all coming from the same three-dimensional object. Okay, so same 3D object, different shadows. You can take four, these four-dimensional objects and actually create different 3D objects that all come from the same four-dimensional object. So they're like different shadows of the four-dimensional object. So this is one particular shadow of the 120 cell, which again, it lives in four dimensions, but you can have different models that look quite different, but they really come from the same place, just like how this looks a lot different from this. Uh, this. Right? They're different 2D, they would be different 2D shadows, but it's the same 3D object. Okay. And then this is called the 600 cell. So this is sort of like a cousin of the 120 cell. It's, uh, these are all made of triangles. And actually, what you do is you take the, uh, all of the, the, the cells, meaning like little 3D caves. As you can see in here, there are all these little spaces inside the object. So if you were to put a point in the middle of each space in the 120 cell and connect it all up, you would get this guy right here. So that, um, which is called the 600 cell. And again, it has all these really beautiful symmetries and they actually correspond to the ones in the 120 cell. So this here has 10-fold symmetry and then again, 6-fold symmetry. And I did not put the one with 4-fold symmetry apparently, but there is one. <laughs> um, and now I can't go back. So, well, uh, I hope you at least, ah, there it is, okay. Uh, why I'm showing you this, now I haven't done any math, I've been talking about math this whole time, but I haven't done any math. Hopefully, you know, you're all pretty happy about that. <laughs> and when I tell people that I do math for a living, common reaction is, oh, that's cool, I hate math, or I'm terrible at it. And that's fine, like I get it, you know, I, I teach math, so I understand, I know the struggle, but why I like this kind of stuff is because you don't need to do any math to look at this and say, hey, that's really cool. And I think that's really important, because math, Math is important, math is exciting. Math is a huge, vast universe of its own. And what you see in school is usually just a tiny, tiny fraction of what's possible. This again, what I showed you, probably new to most of you, but th this is also just a tiny fraction of what's possible. There are so many rich and beautiful things that are possible in the world of mathematics. And I hope I've inspired some of you to maybe either pursue it further, pick up a math major, or just, you know, maybe appreciate math a little more. So I thank you all for coming out. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>